Okay, we are now recording. Welcome everyone to the Shear tonight. Tonight's Shear is being sponsored by our good chaver, Mr. Heshi Piantika, in memory of his parents, Yaakov and Rav Simcha Bunim, and Chayyabas Ruvain in the Shamsal Haven and Aliyah. Parshas Vayetze is a particularly rich sedra. There are, there are so many vital and important hashkafic concepts and limudim that are learned out from the simple reading of the psukim that we could spend probably the entire time of our shir on the first few psukim. We're going to try to expand it a little bit, but I do want to focus at the beginning on the beginning psukim. The famous beginning of the Sedra is Vayetze Yaakov Be'er Sheva Vayele Charona. Yaakov leaves Be'er Sheva. He goes towards Charon, which was at the end of last week's Sedra told to him by his parents to go find a wife. Now we have to understand that we know the nature of Yaakov, and Yaakov is an Ishtam, Yoshev Oholim. He's someone who is a homebody. He sat in the base medrash. He took care of his parents. Here, Yaakov is leaving the one and only home he's known all his life, and he's traveling to Haran. Now, Haran, any of you who know the geography of Eretz Israel, he is now where his parents are in the land of Canaan, and he's going to be going north. And he's going to be going north east towards Haran, towards the area of Mesopotamia, which is a tremendously long distance. And it's not like you can get in your car and go on Highway 1, go north all the way to Metula. It's not where there's a highway to take you there, Highway 60, Highway 1, whatever it is. And there were, there were, no, there were no buses or or caravans of cars. It was all himself, all alone. And he, he leaves Beersheba, which is where he was in the Negev, and he's going all the way to the north. And halfway there, or partway there, the Pusik says, Why, you've got Bamakom. And he chances, he meets a certain place. And Chazal point out that when it says Bamakom, the base with the cut with the patach underneath is the same as be hamakom. Hamakom means a specific place. It wasn't any old place. It wasn't bimakom. It was bamakom, and bamakom means the place. So he comes to this place, which obviously we know is Yerushalayim Eretz Kodesh, and he comes to the place of. The base of Mignosh, as we're going to see later on, by Yolen Sham. And he sleeps there. Kiva Hashem is because the sun sets suddenly. By Yikar Meyam And he takes of the stones of the place, by Yosem and Ashosav, and he puts them around his head. By And he goes to sleep in that place. We're all familiar with this particular series of Sukkim. We're going to go. A little bit more. By Achalomi has a dream, and the Hine Sulam said, there's this ladder standing on the ground, the Rosha Magia Shemaima, the head of the ladder that reaches the heavens, the name Alachel Kim Olim Dimbo, the Malachim are going up and coming down. And of course, Rashi says, what do you mean going up and coming down? Why was it coming down and going up? Because wherever a human being is, there are always Malachim accompanying him, and the Malachim that were taking care of Yaakov. In Eretz Israel, we're going back up to where they belong, and the Malachim, the Malachim of Chutzl Eretz, were coming down to watch over him. And the Hine Hashem needs to follow him. Behold, God is standing by him. By Yom and Hashem says, "Ani Hashem l'kei Avraham Avicha v'lekei Yitzchak." I am Hashem, the God of your father Avraham, the God of Yitzchak. Oretz Hashem to Shalchem Elo l'chot nenos arecha. The land you're sleeping on, I'm going to give to you and to all your children. Famous pasuk, and don't don't break out into Lubavitch and Nigunim here, please. Oh. 
then your right. seed is going to be yeah. like yeah. the dust yeah. of the earth. Famous that's the Ufa, that's the right. And you're going to spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in you and all your family will the nations, will the families of earth be blessed. Let's stop. Let's stop and analyze what's going on. Yaakov is on the way alone. Basically, he's obeying his parents' commands to leave. But the commands were predicated upon the fact that Asaph threatened to kill him. And Rivka knew that, so she sends him away. And Yitzchak backs it up because he doesn't want Yaakov, who is of age, to marry anyone from the land of Canaan. Can you imagine leaving your home in those days from Beersheba, sheltered within the confines of the holiness of a Yitzchak and Rivka, which we discussed at the end of Pasha's Chayasara, the house was filled with laughter. It was filled with holiness. It was filled with all the bare necessities that people were happy with. And now he's got to leave and fend for himself at a young age. It's, it, it, can, put, let's put ourselves in that, in that position. Rabbi, could you mute everybody, please? I, I am doing I'm doing that right now. One minute. I'm gonna take the participants and mute them. Give me a moment. Okay. Mute them to you. All right. Uh, I, I just muted everybody. So if you want to speak from this point on, you're gonna to have to speak up because I just muted everybody. I'll do this to the side. Okay. So so Yaakov is going away on his own. It's a very difficult decision, a very difficult idea that he has to go away and he's He's worried. And he has, he, he comes to the, this place and he, he davens there, like it says, by Yifka ba Mokom. He chanced upon the place, and Rashi points out that by Yifka is Lashon of Tfila. He, he entreats Hashem, he davens there. By the way, we're going to mention this parenthetically, it's very important. Very important. What was he davening when he comes there? Because it says, by Yivka by Mokom, by Yolan Chunky Vo Hashemesh, because the sun had set. Once the sun had set already, it wasn't davening Shacharis, and he wasn't davening Mincha, it was after Shkia, so he was davening Mayrev. Interesting, Rabosai. Number one, Avraham fashioned Shacharis, as the Gemara and Bracha says, Avraham Tikain Tfila Shacharis. Yitzchak. Tikain Tfilas Mincha. Yaakov Tikain Tfilas Myriv. Have you ever thought to yourself, isn't that interesting? Avram Shacharis, Yitzchak Mincha, Yaakov Myriv. That's not the way the Jews count the days. We go Vayehi Erev, Vayehi Voker. The first Tfila of the day is not Shacharis. The first field of the day is Meirev. Why did Avraham establish Shacharis? Why did Yitzchak establish Mincha? And why did Yaakov establish Meirev? Shouldn't it have been that Avraham establishes Meirev the day, the beginning of the day, and then Yitzchak, Shacharis, and Yaakov, Mincha. So there are a lot of discussions about this particular phenomenon. And I think it's important that now that we're discussing Yaakov, we get an understanding of why Yaakov was the one who established Myrev. Let's understand something. Avraham Avinu was the dawn of a new age, a new idea in the world, the idea that man and Hashem, man and God have a connection, that there is a God that rules over everyone, and that man and God have a connection. And this idea was introduced to the world by Avraham Avinu. It was a new day. 
a new dawn, a brilliant idea. Yitzchak, Yitzchak was already the twilight of that beautiful idea. Because by Yitzchak's time, the Plishtim were already stuffing up the wells that Avram dug, even though the wells were life-giving. Yitzchak was sheltered and he couldn't leave Eretz Yisrael. Yitzchak had a Yaakov and an Esav and the sacrifices that Esav's wives gave to Avodah Zorah blinded his eyes. He was unable to see. He gave the bracha to Yaakov because he couldn't see and Hashem organized it that way. But Yitzchak's life was not the dawn that was Avraham's, where he went to war and won every war he fought, no matter how tremendous the odds. People called him Nisi Elokim HaTobu you're a prince of God. Yitzchak was already a little bit in trouble. By Yaakov, it was really difficult. Yaakov's entire life was one of Mayrith, of evening, of darkness, of nighttime. From the very inception of his being, he had to fight with his brother, Esau. From the very beginning of his life, everything was coming with tremendous struggle and difficulty. And even when he listened carefully to his mother and got the rightful blessings that belonged to him, because the blessings were to be given to the one who followed Navraham's ways, and that was Yaakov, nevertheless, because he did what he was supposed to do, there was this tremendous enmity between him and his brother, and he was pursued and chased. And after he runs away to save his life, he goes to a love on. He goes to a, a, a person who's white, you know, pure on the outside, but trickery as they come, full of chicanery, the glib tongue, false ideals and promises. And he had to deal with it. And then he had to come back and fight practically for his own life with the Malach and with Esau. And then his biggest nightmare, where his children were so divisive that Yosef was sold into Mitzrayim. And he himself had to go down to Mitzrayim. He, was, he died in Mitzrayim. His, his, his life was a nightmare. And Yaakov was Mesach and Tfilas Arvis. So we have to understand that even though normally the night begins the day for us, the nature of the persona of Abraham, the nature of the persona of Yitzhak, and the nature of the persona of Yaakov fit this unusual construct that Avram set up Shacharis, Yitzchak set up Mincha, and Yaakov set up Mairith. He's davening Mairith, and he's got a dream. Now, it's interesting, there are a lot of discussions about the fact that Vayikach me avnei hamokom, right? So let's focus on that for a second. He took me avnei hamokom. I'm going to highlight that, okay? Do you see? He took from the stones of the place. May avnei hamokom. From the stones of the place. Let's go down to the end of this dream. And after he's promised everything he was supposed to be given, look what it says here. And I'm going to highlight this now. Bayash came out from Baboker. Avram gets up, in, I mean, Yaakov, Baboka, Yaakov gets up in the morning, by Yikach is Evan, and he takes the stone, which he had placed around his head. Did you notice that when he took it at first, it says, that he took from the stones of the place, you see it right here? Right? And when it comes down to the end, when he wakes up, it says, He took the stone. Rashi comments on this immediately, for those of you who are familiar with the Rashi. And we're going to take a look at it right now. Rashi says right here, when it says, he took from 
the stones of the place, and he put them around his head. Let's learn this Rashi. Says Rashi, he put them around his head like a protective wall. The, uh, yeah, the, I know, they translate Marzev as a drain pipe, but it means like a large drain pipe that would surround your head. Also, come in Marzev, so the Roshi, he put a big the stone around his head. He was afraid of the wild animals, bad animals that are roving at night. So he puts this around his head. We'll get to an explanation perhaps about that in a minute. So the, the stones were arguing with each other. Rashi points out that there were 12 stones and they were arguing amongst each other. Zosomeras, this stone said, This one said, and I'm reading this Rashi for those who are following. This one said, on me, the tzaddik should put his head. Vezos Omeris, and the other one said, Olai Yoniach, on me, the tzaddik should put his head. Now there were 12 stones and they were arguing, we want Yaakov to put his head on my stone. The stones were arguing with each other. They each wanted Yaakov to rest on its particular stone. Niyad, Immediately, Hashem made it into one stone. And that's why it says, Later it says, not avne, not plural, but singular. He took the stone. Now, this is a very significant Rashi for a number of reasons. First of all, it says originally that there were many stones and that they were arguing with each other, so they became one stone. Now, they became one stone around his head, on which he was going to lie his head. But the stone, that's one big stone now, his head is not on every inch of that stone. His head is only on a certain part of the stone. How come when there were many stones, they were all arguing with each other? He should put his head on me. He should put his head on me. So Hashem made them into one stone. Wait a minute. When they're one stone, can each inch of the stone say, I don't want his head on that edge of the stone. I want it on my inch of the stone. Why is he putting his head on that inch? Why not on my inch? Why didn't all the inches of all the stones get together and simply say, you know, we're, we're going to fight over the fact that he's not putting his head on my inch of stone. Why doesn't it say that? The Mepharshim explains so beautifully. You know, when something is united, when something is together, when, when something is united, when the 12 stones become one big stone, when they get united, when they're all united, it doesn't matter where you put the head. It doesn't matter. When Klai Yisrael is united, it doesn't matter where you're sitting. Where you're sitting is the head of the table. When we're together, it doesn't matter what seat you're in, what row you're in. It doesn't matter. We're one community. You go to a CMA Shas with 100,000 Jews. And yes, rightfully so that there should be a dais with all the gedolei ador. But every single Jew who goes and learns together the daf yomi is united with every other Jew. And it doesn't matter where you're sitting. It doesn't matter as long as you're united. When you're divided, uh, then it becomes problematic. Then it becomes problematic. Where do I, where does he put, where does the put his head? Where's the, where's the Rosh Hashiva sitting next to? Who is the Rebbe sitting next to? Where do I sit when there's a dinner? You put me at this table? <laughs> Doesn't matter. The chicken's the same at both places. It doesn't matter. When the class is united, it doesn't matter. So that's observation number one. Let's go back to the Pusset and see some other observations. 
right now to the Pussy. Okay, back to the Pussy. So, if I ask him, Yaakov Aboka, back, back, back to the Pussy originally, where we said there's a, there's a ladder on the ground, its head is reaching the heavens, and he took, uh, he took the stones before this, took the Avni Amokom, he puts them around his head. Let's focus on this. Rashi told us, why did he put the stones around his head, Rabbi Osai? Do you remember? Why did he put the stones around his head? What was the reason that he put them around his head? So Rashi med- mentioned, and we learned the Rashi just a few moments ago. The Rashi said, why Savin Larosho? Sheyore Mipne Chayos Ra'os. Because he was afraid of wild animals, bad wild animals. Chayos Ra'os. So let me ask you a question, my dear friends. You come on the mountain, there are wild beasts around, so you take some stones, you put them around your head. Is that going to protect you from the wild beasts? They're going to come right by your feet and chew you to pieces. What good is it if you put it around your head? And the posset seems to emphasize. It doesn't say by Yosem Sevivo that he put them around himself. No. Around his head. Rav Sham Shemifaral Hirsch so beautifully explains. Yaakov is leaving his home. What is his greatest fear? I'm going where I don't have any Torah support. I don't have a Jewish community. My father and mother are not with me. The pillars of righteousness in the world are going to be back in Be'er Sheva and I'm going to be in Haram. And we're in Haram. Love on. Love on. Who would kill for money. Has no scruples. Devoid of righteousness. I'm going to him. You know what the greatest danger is when I go to Haran? It's not my physical danger. It's not my body that I have to worry about. It's my head. It's my head. When I go to New York, I'm worried about my head. I'm worried about what does the atmosphere do to my head? When you go on your internet phone, you should be worried about your head. When you interact with the secular world at large, although it's needed for so many reasons, including a basic Parnassa, where's your head? Yaakov is teaching us that when a Jew is involved with the world at large, the one thing you have to protect is your head. Don't worry about everything else. You have to protect that too. But most important, a Jew must protect his head. And Yaakov, going out to Gullis, is giving us the paradigm of what a Jew has to do. He's got to protect his head. Let's go back to the Pasuk. And we're going to go to where it says, Vayachalom, and he dreams, Vihine Sulam Mutsav Artsa. Behold, there's a ladder that's standing on the ground, Virosho Magia Hashemaima, and its head reaches up to the heavens. Abosai, do you remember? I'm sure my good friend Maya Ruth is going to remember this because we both went to RJJ. Maybe in the other yeshivas, they were also in the same thing, in the shakos and so on. When you graduated eighth grade, right? You had an autograph. Yeah. The autograph book, right? Yes. And, 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 and all your friends, you would ask them, sign my autograph book. Right, right, right. And 99 out of 100 times, they all wrote, climb the ladder of success. And they usually spelled success with dollar signs <laughs> instead of essence. Yes. Because they thought that that was the ladder of success, I remember. 
So climb the ladder of success. Yaakov is the first one who's climbing the ladder of success. The Sulam, he's climbing the ladder of success. Now I want you to know that the word Sulam here, if you'll take a look at it, is spelled without a vav. Samach Lamed Mem. But the truth of the matter is that the word Sulam is spelled with a vav. In the Torah, in this spot, it's not, for whatever reason. The fact is that the word Sulam itself is spelled with a vav. Now, it's not by coincidence that the word Sulam spelled with a vav has a certain numerical value, a gematria. And I'm going to show you something. I'm going to rather talk about something. Do you remember on Rosh Hashanah? Do you remember when we were davening on Rosh Hashanah and we said Unisana Tokef? Do you remember when we said Unisana Tokef? We said Uteshuva Utefila Utsudaka Shuva repentance Fila prayer Utsudaka and charity Ma'avirin Esroa Hagazera take away the evil decree. You all remember that, right? Yes. Now, go to your mazer. Right. You're going to see an interesting thing. On top of the word Uteshuva, cool. you're going to cool. find the word Som. Oh. So. Fasting. On top of the word Tfila, you're going to find the word Kol voice. And on top of the word tzedakah, you're going to find a little mama. word mamon. Mamon, yeah. Mamon. Rabbo say, say, listen carefully. The word sulam, samach, vav, lamed mem, add it up. A samach is 60. A vav is 6. That's 66. A lamed is 90. Yeah. It's 30. That gives you 90. 30, 30. 30. Total of 96. A mem mm -hmm. is 40. 136. 136. Let's go to those other three words. Tzom. Fasting. 90. Sadik is 90. 90. Love is 6. 96. Mem is 40. 40 or 96. 136. 136. Kol. Kuf. 100. Vav. 6. Lamed. 30. 136, Mamon, Mem 40, Mem 40 is 80, Vav 86, Nun 50, 50 136. 136. We have a ladder that we can climb to success in our lives. Keeping in mind that we're capable of doing tshuva. Keeping in mind that we're capable of davening tacos, broken, And keeping in mind that we can help by giving stucker to change evil decrees. Yaakov Avinu taught us that we have a connection, a sulam. That sulam is me, is you, is us. Our feet are planted on the ground. Our heads, magia hashamayma. Our minds reach the heavens, a human being can become so infused with the beauty of a connection of Hashem, with Hashem that even though they're living here in the physical here and now, they're capable of becoming Kadosh because their minds are capable of soaring to the heaven. We're capable of touching the divine. We're capable of looking into a human being's eyes and seeing the spark of Hashem that flickers within the soul of every human being because their feet may be on the ground, but our heads soar in the heavens. So Yaakov is this paradigm of every single Jew. And even when we're going on the way to Golis, 
מוצא ועצה וראש המגיע השמיימה. הם הלכי אלוקים עולים ויורדים בו. Are going up and coming down within this ladder. Now, there's a lot more going on over here that needs to be spoken about. And at some point, we hope to be able to come back to it. Right now, I want to get to something that almost invariably comes on Parshas Vayetze. So we're going to go way ahead. We're going to go way ahead, and we're going to come to the point where Yaakov marries Leah. We know the whole story with the switch that love on that divine trickster, that impossible man filled with chicanery. You can't trust the word he says. I, I sometimes think he would make a great politician. So <laughs> Lovan over here, white on the outside, but as, as improper as you can imagine on the inside, switches. He was supposed to marry Rachel. He puts Leia in the place. The beautiful, beautiful discussion of Rachel giving away her life, hope, and dream to her sister Leah is in and of itself a parsha that we could spend hours on. But we're going to a different section. It says that Hashem saw that Rachel was more loved than Leah, and so Leah has a son named Reuven. Hashem Hashem saw my, my pain. My affliction. Then she has another son, Shimon, Kishama Hashem. Hashem heard. Then she has a third son. And she says, This time my husband will be joined to me. And then Vatar Od, she again becomes pregnant, right? Vatar Od, she becomes pregnant again. Vatela Bain, we're on this Pasuk now. You can take a look and read it. Read with us. Okay. Vatar od vateled bain, she get, becomes pregnant again and gives birth to a son, vatomer, and she says, hapaam, this time, ode es Hashem. I am going to thank Hashem. Now, there are a lot of questions about why only this time. Rashi mm -hmm. answers it. We don't have time even to go to the Rashi, but I'm going to tell you what he says. Rashi answers why this time Leia explains because she got even more than she was originally destined to have. She now had four of the 12 tribes, which is one more than each wife could possibly have. If each would have three, there'd be 12 tribes. So Rashi says she got more than her share. The Gemara in Brachos makes a statement when it says that Leia said, Apam Oda es Hashem, this time I will thank Hashem, the Gemara and Bracha says, Ad Shabbos Leia, until Leia came along, Lo Hayami Shehodel Hashem. There was no one who gave thanks to Hashem. Can you imagine that statement? That's a pretty wild statement of the Gemara. Until Leah, no one thanked Hashem, which is patently not so. But what is the difference? Here's the difference. Many thanked Hashem before this. Noach, Noach. Adam, Hevel, all thanked Hashem. They all brought carbonos. Avraham, Yitzchak, they all thanked Hashem. Yaakov, Thank Hashem. But there's one difference. Leah is thanking Hashem now for her tsaris. Leah saw that all the difficulties I had until now were only to prepare me for the gift of having this next son. And so she called his name Yehuda. What does Yehuda mean? Thanks. He 
will give thanks. He will give thanks. Rabosan, are you aware that Kemat every year at this time we read Parshas Vayetze? And every single Jew, you know where the word Jew comes from? Yuda. It comes from Yehuda. The Yud became a J, Judah, shortened Judah. to Jew. Yeah. And Jew means to give thanks. Mm. If anyone comes along and says to you, do you celebrate Thanksgiving? You say, are you kidding? I'm the Yehudi. I give thanks all the time, every day. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Hashem Nosan Lasech Vivina Lahafka Min Yom Avei Loyla, Shakol Ni Eved Varo, Modeh Ani Levanecha, I give thanks to you, Hashem. And the second you open your eyes, we're Yehuda. You want to know if we celebrate Thanksgiving? Are you kidding? Yeah, but did you eat turkey? Don't be a turkey. I give thanks to Hashem all the time. There is a, there is a halacha question. There is a halacha question about is a Jew allowed to have more than the Yom Tovim in the Torah? And is a Jew allowed to eat turkey on Thanksgiving? Rav Moshe Zatzal has a very interesting tshuva on it. And let, it, let us say that there's absolutely nothing wrong in giving thanks to Hashem. On the contrary, I want to tell you, I want to share with you what my grandmother, she should rest in peace, Shana Leia, said to us one Thanksgiving when I was a child. My grandmother came here as a very, very young child. She escaped with her parents from the pogroms in Kishinev, from Russia. And she said, you come to the United States of America. And Hashem allowed us the luxury of being, as Rav Moshe himself called it, in a Malchus Shel Chesed, a kingdom of kindness. And we don't have to look behind our shoulders and backs that any second a pogrom is going to come. Despite the fact that there's plenty of anti-Semitism that we're aware of and much that we're not aware of. But the fact is that there's no inherent governmental, you might even say pandemic of anti-Semitism. It is not a feature of the very core and nature of the society. And there's no history of evil anti-Semitism in general. That's the thank Hashem. And if you get it, if you get to a Thanksgiving dinner and you say Divrei Torah and you say Hodu Lashem Kito, Kalakavod, there's nothing wrong. There is something wrong in making it into an avodah I must have turkey with all the trimmings that go along with it. I must. That's a problem. You want to get to get to get? That's chukas agoy. Right. If you make it to the point where it's, where it's, where it's, if I don't do it, I'm, I'm not <laughs> observing the commandments, forget it. But if you're saying, I'm going, we're having Thanksgiving, we're giving thanks to Hashem. Some people make a turkey for Shabbos. Fine, whatever it is. The point is, Rabosai, here's the key. Leia said it. Hapam Ode Es Hashem. We are called Jews because it comes from the word Yehuda. Mode Ani Lefanecha. I thank you, Hashem. I thank you for every breath of air that you give me that I can take every single day, every single second of every single day, of every single day of the rest of my life. Because that is what a Jew is all about. That's a Yehudi. That's someone from the tribe 
of Yehuda. And so the Jewish people are known by that name, not coincidentally, but because Leah gave thanks, even for the most difficult things in the world. Now there is another interpretation we should mention. And that is, Leah is giving thanks for a natural phenomenon, giving birth. It's true that giving birth is a miracle. And it's true that every life is a miracle, but it's a natural phenomenon. Many of us are under the impression that miracles that need thanks are things that are beyond the normal, beyond the mundane and the daily. Oh no, look at this pasuk. Do you see that it's in blue? Do you see the blue? Do you see the blue? Yeah, you see blue? That's a miracle. Why don't we just see black and white? We see blue. Hey, there's green up there. There's red. Photography, pictures, facial expressions. Unbelievable gift of sight. Zoom. There we go, the zoom. There we go, the right, the right the to be part of barrel. The right to be part of a community like ours. It's a gift of Hashem. It's a miracle. It's an ace. So Leia is teaching us, and that's what the Gemara meant when it says, until Leia, nobody thank God for the average normal things. Everything was a miraculous nature. Oh, you're giving me the land of Israel. I got to bring a carbon. What about my breathing? What about I'm eating? You know, I often say, you know, Akadish Baruch Hu could have made it. You know, just think about that. Like yeah. a car. We could be like a car, you know? That there's a little gauge in our brain that when you finish eating, it is on the full side. And then as a day or two goes by, it gets to E empty. So you got to go fill up, or otherwise you're going to die. So you go to a filling station. You open your mouth, they take a nozzle, they inject enough nutrients for the next five days. Okay, sir, you're finished, 20 bucks. You're out, and no taste, no texture, no presentation. It's like all the restaurants are closed because of the COVID. You don't see any, any food. It's like unbelievable. Hashem could have made it like that. He could have made it that that's the way we eat. But he gave us a miracle. Food, texture, taste, color, size, variation. Unbelievable. What a gift. It's normal. But we don't realize every single one of those things is a miracle. It's a miracle. So Leia is teaching us that the Jew doesn't only thank for miraculous things, which Baruch Hashem happened all the time, but for mundane things, average things, and even things that come with a lot of service. That ultimately, even Leia recognized, Hapam Oded Es Hashem. Yeah. Unbelievable how much more there is in this particularly very super rich sedra. I'm going to leave you with a question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask this question tomorrow night in shul, but I'm going to leave you with a question to think about. Look what it says here. Ata, atomer. And she said, Hapam Oda Es Hashem. This time I'm thanking Hashem. Al Kain Kara Shemo Yehuda. Therefore she called his name Yehuda. The next two words, Ata Amod Miledes. She stopped giving birth. Wait a minute. After thanking and giving so much blessing, why did she stop giving birth? And she wanted more children, as we see later on in the Sedra. So it's almost as if she's coming and saying, I want to thank Hashem, and the Jewish people are thankful. And then the Torah seems to be giving her a little stuck. The Torah seems to be giving her a little bit of a piece of their mind. She stopped giving birth. Why did she stop? If she gave thanks, she should have had more and more children. Why does it say she stopped? And it was bothering her, as you'll see from the rest of the schedule later on. Here's the question. Why are these two things connected 
it would seem they should not be connected. Because she thinks the good as good as the bad. So because why she didn't she have no because she stopped children, you would think that she wouldn't be thankful. No, no, but no, 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 no. Beryl, she sank first, and then the Pusik says she stopped giving birth. But why did she stop? Why did why did Hashem make it she couldn't have more children when she really she really just gave thanks? She should have been blessed with more. That's the question. No, this ain't this is the Torah talking to us. It should it, it doesn't seem to be connected. There, there's some problem here. We gotta figure that out. Anyway, try to work on it on Shabbos and Yetz Hashem. We're gonna try to answer that particular question. Something to think about. Okay. Want to wish everybody a wonderful, wonderful Shabbos Yashkalach. Good to have Heshi Piantico once again. Yaakov and Simp Labunim and Chaya Bas Ruvain. The Zechan Ishmasam and the Shamsal Abba and Aliyah. Every one of us should be Zoom. Amen. To learn and we learn in their memory to bring about an Aliyah for the Nishama. Any questions? Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, because we're Bottom about to... Line, were you allowed to eat turkey today or not? <laughs> you are allowed. We already said that you're allowed. Uh-huh. Don't make Kiddush. No. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's no more Kiddush. There's no more Kiddush. How'd you make a brocha? Of course. There's no more, no more There's no Kiddush. No. Rabbi Agroisi Yashikoyach. Uh, Rabbi Yashikoyach, and thank you for everything, like you're always. Very, you're very welcome. <laughs> You're very well. Okay, have a good Shabbos, everybody. Have a good now Shabbos. I want, one more. I, I want to wish you. May are we going to see you in Shul Shabbos? Who? Maya. You have to ask Maya. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, this... I'll send my representative. I'll send the Shalia. Okay. Uh-huh. All right, Abosai, you're always welcome. Next Thursday night, Berlin Eder. We're going to go to the next Sedja. Everyone is cordially invited. Get the word out. There are. Uh, this has been recorded and will be presented on the uh, on the website. How could, I, how could you watch it? You got to go on the. You go, you go on, on the, the website. website. Go to the no, website. Dave, Dave has to post it's, it. it's on the website. It will be posted on the website. Let me